good morning, church. And all the people did say amen. I love that song. I'm glad we sang that one this morning. Welcome to week 13 of the big picture, a 15-week journey through the Word of God, beginning in Genesis, ending in the book of Revelation, week 13. So I thought it might be good just to sort of pause, stop for a moment, get our bearings of where we're at. You might remember back in January, you probably don't, but I did say this back in January, there are four divisions to the books of the Old Testament, then there's four centuries of silence, then four divisions to the books of the new testament the four divisions of the books of the old testament i think we could bring those up there on the screen were simply the books of law the books of history the books of poetry and the books of prophecy major prophets and minor prophets and then after 400 years of silence god speaks again in the new testament and we have four divisions in the books of the new testament we have the gospels matthew mark luke and john we have the book of history we have the letters or the epistles and that's like uh, romans through jude telling us how to live the christian life and then we call the last book a book of prophecy as we think about heaven. Now, if you were here last week, and most of you I think were, you saw that we went into the life of Christ in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So today, week 13 brings us into the book of Acts, the New Testament book of history. So I just thought I'd start with some facts on Acts, all right? So let me sort of just lay the groundwork for all this here. The author of this book is Luke, and yet the name sounds familiar because he wrote the third Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke may not have realized that, but he wrote both these books, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. The date for the book is somewhere in the early 60s, and it takes in a time frame from about 30 A.D., the resurrection of Jesus right after it, to about 60 A.D. An outline for the book of Acts is found actually right in the first chapter of the book. It's when Jesus is getting ready to send his apostles out into the world with the message of the gospel, and he says, you're going to receive power. Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. And so when you look at the book of Acts, you can remember that verse because chapters 1 through 7, they take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, into the city of Jerusalem. It's like us taking it across the streets. And then in chapters 8 through 12, they take it into Judea and Samaria, a little wider region. It's like us helping the gospel go across the states with the missions that we support. Then chapters 13 to 28, they take the gospel all the way around the world. It's like us supporting missionaries that that serve in in foreign countries and, and, and supporting them financially as they do the work that the Lord's called them to do. Now, how about the people in the book here? Well, it's called the Acts the book of Acts, but it's actually referring to the Acts of the Apostles. And Jesus sends them out, and they start preaching and teaching. Primarily, this is sort of simplifying in here. In chapters 1 through 12, you have the ministry of Peter emphasized. And then in chapters 13 through 28, in the rest of the book, you have the ministry of the Apostle Paul emphasized. The missionary journeys. Remember Paul's missionary journeys. He takes the gospel all the way around the world. So that's what happens in the latter part of the book. The focus of the book is what we're doing here and what we are. It's the beginning of the church. It is the church that Jesus Christ died for. Acts is the only book that gives us the history and tells us how the early church was born and spread. Boy, what a start it was. By the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, chapter 28, Paul is being persecuted for being a Christian. And he's put in jail for a while, and he writes letters from that jail cell that we would know later on as some of the books of the New Testament. And one of those, the book of Colossians, here's what he says uh, when he gets to the book of Acts, the end of the book of Acts. He says the gospel's growing throughout the entire world. The church is on fire. And since a river is purest at its source, I believe it would be good for us to go back to the source, to the beginning point, and uncover, see what made the church so great, so awesome in its very beginning. And to make it our prayer, Father, what they were then, help us to become that now. And I think the temptation when we do that this morning is going to sort of be for us to keep things vague and general and sort of, you know, make it personal when it comes to you and me. Because when we say the word church, we get this idea of a building or an institution or an organization, a place. But when the Bible talks about the church, it's not talking about place. It's talking about people. We're the church. The church is not a place. The church is people who find their place in the family of God. Now, we have a vision statement and a mission statement. We show that at the beginning of each service uh, as the, the slides are rolling before we begin our first song. And you know what? Our vision statement and our mission statement 
even our core values that we have, they're based right out of this passage of Scripture. You know, our vision is that loving people, serving community, transforming lives. That's Acts chapter 2. Our mission are three C's. We want people to connect with God and one another. We want them to cultivate, to grow their faith, and we want them to contribute their love. You're going to see that in one way or another in this passage of Scripture this morning. In the birthday, the birthday and the blueprint of the church. Remember, the river is purest at its source. So let's go back to the source here. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see some great things today. Maybe we should change that prayer a little bit. Uh, Father, what they were then, help us to become now to this. Father, what they were then, help me to become that now, because I am, you are, the church. And what a place this was when it first started out. What kind of place was it? It was a place where Jesus Christ was lifted up and exalted, first and foremost. That's number one. The first sermon ever preached after Jesus died and resurrected from the grave is right here in Acts chapter 2. And it's all about Jesus, and he gets to the end of the sermon, and here's what he says, Peter does, in verse 36. He says, let all of Israel know this, this Jesus whom you've crucified is now both Lord and Messiah. He's conquered death. It's all about him. This is the very day the church began, and Peter's saying, it's not about us, it's all about Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself put it like this in Matthew chapter 16. He said, you know what? I'm going to build my church. The church is the church of Jesus Christ. No man leads her, no denominational headquarters owns her, no family runs her, no the one who is no longer dead sits alone as her head. After his resurrection, Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 28. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That includes this church. He built her, he designed her, he died for her. So we need to get that, I think. My church is not mine, it's his. That's why we call ourselves the church of Christ, belonging to him. That's why when the church began, they met in his name, they pray, prayed in his name, they preached in his name, they met on his day, the Lord's day. That's one of the reasons when a person's getting ready to be baptized, we'll have them repeat what we call the good confession of faith. It's right on that day when Jesus talked about his church, he said, hey, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded by saying this in Matthew 16, verse 16, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, on that rock, on that confession, I'm going to build my church. So when we state that, it's a reminder, I'm becoming a member of the family that's not all about me, it's all about him. So that helps me, because I've got to shift my mindset away from my seat, my songs, my way, my opinion, from what makes me happy to what honors him. Does my worship honor him? Does my service honor him? Does my giving honor him? Does my love for, for people honor him? Does my attitude honor him? Does the way that I handle uh, my problems honor him? You know, it's, it's Jesus in his church. So I got to think about making sure I live in such a way, if Jesus is the head and the church is his body, it's all about him, that I don't give Jesus a black eye in this community. Father, what was true of them, make it true of me. Church is not a place, it's people who find their place. Here's the second thing we find about this true church in the beginning. It was a place where truth was proclaimed. Boy, that's significant in because we live in a world that, well, it's, I'm going to call it an outback steakhouse world. Remember their motto? Let me go ahead and show that for you. No rules, just right. I mean, isn't that 2021? There's no fixed standard of truth. What's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. No rules, no truth, just right. You know what, I, that, that's so inconsistent. I, I'm sure even that restaurant doesn't uh, follow that particular motto because no, no rules. You know, if you say you want it well done, he brings it out rare. Ah, there's no rules here. You know, just, there, there's no rules in the way we prepare this food. No rules in the, how, how I serve this food to you on your head, on your lap. No, they don't even do that, right? And, and, and people in general don't do that either. We live in a schizophrenic world. We say we want certain rules, like your light to be red when mine's green, huh? But only one-third of us, according to one study, and it's getting even worse, believe that there are clear matters of right and wrong morally. There's rules on the way that we live. Only one out of every three Americans believe that. Like I said, it's heading in the wrong direction. No set fixed truth. 
But then you leaf through Scripture and you discover page after page how important truth is to God. God is truth, we're told. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The Bible is called, like I said, the book of truth. That's why shortly after this resurrection of Jesus that occurred that we celebrated, and we celebrate every Sunday, but in particular, I guess, last Sunday, when the city of Jerusalem swells to ten times its normal size because they have this grand feast that takes place, God uses it as the occasion for the birthday of his church, and in doing so, he builds it around a foundation of truth the foundation of Scripture. If we took time to read Peter's first sermon, which is about verses 14 to verse 36 or so in this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2, we find at least three times he quotes Scripture, at least three times. And here's the thing, if you read it, it's really not a really sort of feel-good, motivational sermon to, to win friends and influence people. It's a sermon that just simply in God's grace, lays out truth. It tells us, first of all, the truth about Jesus. And here's what it says about Jesus, that he was sent from God, that he died a death on a cross for our sins. It was God's plan that he would do that. That's how much God loves us. He arose bodily from the grave. And now verse 36, he's Lord of all. And then it tells the truth about me in this passage of Scripture. You know, one of the big temptations for the church today is to go so far in trying to win the world over that we nearly become what the world is. And the lines get blurred. Look how much we're like you. It's almost like you can come to Jesus and it doesn't really have to affect your day-to-day life. But in the beginning, after the people turned to Peter and said, what do we need to do about this one you've told us about, this Jesus What do we need to do about him? The very first word out of his mouth basically was verse 38, repent. Not just say a simple prayer or just show up once in a while. Not don't get all concerned about any major changes in your life. No, the first word was repent. Not look for a way to rationalize your sin or to justify it. It's to repent of it. Repent means to do a turnaround, to say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done in my life. I'm sorry for how I've offended you, and I want my life to change. I want the direction of my life to go your direction. Now, last week we spoke about how Jesus was full of grace and truth. And since the Bible pictures Jesus as the head of the church and the church's body, you know what? We've got to be that way too. We have to be, first of all, the grace place, the place where the broken and the hurting and the lost feel at home. We have to be a hospital for wounded sinners, not just a showcase for self-righteous saints. But in doing so, we must also be the truth place, a place where God's word and God's son are not compromised. If the diagnosis comes back that you have leukemia, you want a doctor who not only has good bedside manner, You want one who will shoot straight with you. Here's your condition. Here's the treatment. And the church has to shoot straight when it comes to the way our diseased world is and what God's word says. Yeah, good bedside manner, full of grace, but also be able to share the truth of the condition. Friend, the truth about me, the truth about you is I don't just need a little fine tuning. I just don't have a few mistakes that need correcting. I have fatal sins that need forgiven. I don't necessarily need Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz. I need Dr. Jesus. See, there's two truths about me that I need to grasp. First of all, I am deeply flawed by my sin. And secondly, thank God I'm greatly loved by him. That God would go that far to save me. His son in my place I love that old story you might remember of John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. He wrote that song, Amazing Grace, and he had sort of a troubled life. He got to the end of it. His mind was a little cloudy. He said, there's a lot of things I don't remember. There's two truths I do remember. Number one is I'm a great sinner. Number two is Jesus is even a greater Savior. The truth about Jesus, the truth about me. And then it tells us the truth about salvation in this passage of Scripture in verse 37 and verse 38. At the end of the first gospel sermon, the listeners, the brokenhearted, they ask in verse 37, hey, what do we need to do about this? This Jesus, I mean, we believe what you're teaching us. Now what what do we need to do to respond? And all humanity leans forward to hear Peter's reply. He doesn't say, sorry, you've missed your chance. He's a one-shot God. No, our God's the God of a second chance. So Peter says this. The very first time the words are spoken in in response to that question after the resurrection of Jesus in verse 38, he says this. He says, repent of your sins and I want you to be baptized 
for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ so you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice Peter didn't say repent and say the sinner's prayer or repent and pray through at an altar, but repent and be baptized. It's almost like he's picturing this death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus physically and what transpires in us spiritually. It's like a spiritual tomb that buries the past and a spiritual womb that births the future. And if it wasn't there, I wouldn't preach it, but it's there. And he says, this is the benchmark of a new beginning, sort of a drawing, drawing the line in the sand. So let me ask you today, because I know we have so many different people here. Have you come to the point where you, you believe all this about Jesus? Are you convicted about the sin in your life and your life's not the way God wants it to be? And then have you been baptized? Have you been immersed into Christ? If not, why not? There are a lot of great spiritual concepts in this verse, though, this verse 38. I want you to look at that verse on the screen with me. It talks about repentance. It talks about baptism. It talks about forgiveness. It talks about receiving God's presence, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But to me, the two most important words are right in the middle, Jesus Christ. Salvation's in Jesus. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 12 of this same book, here's what he would say. He would say, salvation's found in nobody else. No other name than the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that may not be politically correct, and it may be mocked by people that you know, but the question is, if not him, who? Because Jesus is the only Savior that's taken care of my guilt problem before holy God. He took my punishment for me, and he's the only Savior who's taken care of my grave problem. When I die, he conquered death for me. Here's a third thing that's true about this church in the beginning. This church was a place where relationships were built. As I look through this passage of Scripture, and if you would go and reread it today, you'll discover that faith in Christ, yes, is a personal decision, but it's not a private experience. And we need to catch the difference there. See, nobody can believe in Jesus for you. When you stood in front of a group of believers, and let's say you said, yeah, I do believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you were baptized, nobody could do that for you. That was a personal decision. Your faith is a personal decision, but once it's confessed, it cannot, it's not to be lived out in a private way. Here's what I'm trying to say. Believing always meant belonging. And you see that in a word that's used in this passage of Scripture. You see it once in verse 44. You see it twice in verse 46, depending on which version you're using. And the word is simply this, together, together. They were together. They met together. They prayed together. They worshiped together. They, they, they ate together. They studied the Bible together, 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 together. And if you would go back and read this passage that Jeff read at the beginning, verse 42 to 47, right here at the, the heart and soul of what the church was at its birthday, you would discover that when the church first began, there's no personal pronouns in this passage of Scripture. In fact, the words are they and their and everyone and all believers. So we've got to get this thing, believing meant belonging. There's no such thing in the Bible, in the New Testament, as an ABC, anything but church Christian. You don't find it. And yet a whole bunch of believers say, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't have and I don't need a church home. And, you know, maybe I'll show up, you know, once a year or whatever. That's like saying I'm a basketball player and I don't, I don't need a team. I'm one on five, man. Even LeBron James has a team. The Bible knows no such thing as a lone ranger believer. We wouldn't have most of the New Testament if it wasn't for real, live congregations like what we have here. Most of the New Testament, Thessalonians, Philippians, Colossians, other books are written to real, live congregations where the members were connected to one another in the first century. And the word they used is this word. Let's bring it up, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. You're members of God's household. Now, when you think of members, what do you think of? Maybe we think of a club, an organization, dues. That's not the way the Bible uses members. Here, here's how it's used in Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. Each of us has one body with many members, arm, hand, right? And these members don't all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. So when the Bible uses the term member to describe you and me, it's talking about members of a body of believers. You're an arm. You're the, you're the hand. You're, we have different functions here. Jesus is the head. The church is his body. Now, your head and your body, I hope we realize they're inseparable, right? 
That means a Christian not connected to a church family is like saying, I have a head, I just don't have a body. Something's missing. In the beginning, believers' relationship with Jesus connected them in four different ways. Let me show it like this. In the center is the relationship with Jesus. We become a Christian. Then at the top, if you can't read that, that says a large group. In verse 41, it says that day 3,000 people were baptized that day, and they were added to the number of the church. So this is the large group. We're meeting together as the church. But they also had a medium-sized group. You might notice the phrase there. It says in verse 46, they met together in the temple courts. That might be 20, 30 people, whatever, whatever could fit in the temple court. So maybe you're talking there in terms of a Bible enrichment class or a special class that we might do. But then they had what we could call a smaller group. They met in each other's homes in verse 46. We have our small groups that we have that we want people to be a part of and make a commitment to. They even had a connection to the unsaved, uh, the favor of all the people that they had in verse 47 in other words they were impacting the community around them we need all four of those different relationships as the church it's it's like this I can hold up this toothpick and I can easily break this toothpick okay I can easily break it like that but if I have a whole package of toothpicks I'm not going to try to break this for you. Maybe Jeremy Dowler could do that this morning, you know. He's a little bit more muscular than I am. But I'm not going to try to do that. And the point of that is simply this. The more connections there are, the stronger we become. Now, think about that, that chart we just showed there, the connections. Who are you connected to in the body of believers? What, what, what could you say? They're in my corner. He's in my corner. She's with me. I, I, can, I can go to them. and there's a, there's a connection there. I have a few Zig Ziglar books in my library. I love reading his books. They're always positive. He tells about a time when he and his son were golfing. And his son was just a mediocre golfer, but they were on this course, and they were on the first par four hole. And he said he looked down, and his son was on the green and two getting ready to putt. Uh, sort of a tough putt for birdie and he helped his son line it up and he said which way it's going to break and it was going to be his son's first birdie and his son hit the putt and very, at the very end it rolled right into the edge and, and, and went down into the bottom of the cup and he, they hooted and hollered and everybody in the entire course knew that Zig's son got his first birdie that day and then it dawned on Zig that he too was on the green and he had a much shorter putt for birdie and so he was lining it up and he began to think you know what I don't want to rain on my son's parade so I kind of just push this putt out to the right a little bit miss it on purpose but then he began to think you know this goes against everything I've taught my son about always excelling and doing your best so he said I tried with all my heart and I hit that putt and it went right dead center into the hole and and my son said to me you know congratulations dad nice putt they put the flag back in the the hole and they were walking off and Zig said he put his arm around his boy and he said I got a question for you he said his son said dad what's that he said let me ask you were you rooting for me and his son looked up at him with a smile and he said dad I'm always rooting for you and could that be said about you in this church I mean have you developed that kind of relationship with others where you know beyond a shadow of doubt that they're in your corner and you're in their corner and this is family and we're rooting for each other as we're cheerleaders for Jesus Christ. i tell you something else about this church. I love it. It was a place where needs were met. What kind of needs? Spiritual needs were met. Verse 38, he talks about forgiveness. Verse 47, he says, those who were saved, salvation. How about emotional needs being met? They had a place to belong. They had something to live for. Just a few days earlier, back in chapter 1, they're holed up behind locked doors in fear for their life. But now, because of the resurrection of Jesus and the presence of God's Spirit with them, there's a joy and a peace in their verse 46. They're praising God, and he's using them to make a difference in people's lives. Even physical needs were met. This is, this is amazing to me what they did. If you look at verse 44 and verse 45 in the text, it said the believers were together and they had everything in common. And then it says this, they sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. That just amazes me. Now that wasn't forced. This is not some early form of communism or socialism. 
Jesus nowhere commanded all believers to sell their homes. In fact, in verse 46, it says they met in each other's homes. So later in chapter 5, you might remember when Ananias and Sapphira, they had the lie to God and they lied to Peter and they said they had given up all this money from the proceeds of their land. And Peter said, didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Couldn't you do with the money whatever you wanted to do with it? So nowhere in the Bible was this forced or it's not communism or socialism. This is just voluntary thing that they're doing to help those. What had happened here, when some people professed their faith in Jesus, they had lost their jobs. Some were cut off from their family. We disown you. And so they're poor and they're destitute. And it's sort of like, you know, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. So you've got this overflowing love in the church. When Christ enters your life, you learn to genuinely care about other people. You start becoming generous with God and, and concerning his blessings in your life. You live with an open hand, not a clenched fist. Your life becomes not a reservoir of his blessings, but a channel of his love, his generosity. You start caring for someone other than yourself. Jesus said it would be that way. John 13, verse 35, he said, everybody's going to know you're following me. If they see your love we live in a world that so desperately needs this right it's like this I can look out through this rolled up piece of paper and see who's asleep over here <laughs> who's getting ready to get up and get their drink of water over here you know uh, so I can see you know just different ones I push it away and I get the whole perspective the whole picture and I think what happens sometimes is we go through life like this we just have a tunnel vision, and we just see our job, our desires, this tight radius of our perspective. It's almost like we're viewing life through a rolled up piece of paper. And you know what God wants to do? He wants you to let him step in and push that tunnel vision away and open our eyes to see people and needs and opportunities to be a channel of his blessing. Don't go through life just looking at the tight radius of just stuff that makes you you happy now you got to think about a way i got to think about a way of making that practical pray and we could pray god what is one thing you want me to do to show somebody else this week the love of jesus christ a channel of blessing for you singer art bush who's been here before said he'd like to one day write a song entitled god i'll never have a nerve to lift uncalloused hands to you and what he was saying there spiritually speaking i, I don't want to reach out someday with an unused hand a hand never used by serving and shake the nail pierced hand of jesus christ find a place and fill it find a hurt and heal it find a need and meet it if you do you'll discover in the words of jesus it is true it is more blessed to give than to receive and i love this church because it's a church where they said you know what we're all in it was a place where commitment was expected and you look at this passage of scripture and the birthday of the blueprint of the church and you see what they were committed to and they were committed first of all to gather like i said in verse 44 and verse 46 that word together all believers are together they met together they worship together they study together 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 as we said earlier following god has always meant believing as well as belonging when you believe in god you'll belong to the family of god so make this worship time non-negotiable gather secondly there was a commitment to grow I would love for this church to be a church of 242 Christians. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is the 242 place. They committed, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You know what that is? That's scripture, the word of God. To fellowship, that's connecting with other people in the family of God. To breaking of bread, there's the Lord's Supper. We do that every Sunday. And to prayer. And think of four arrows here. One arrow going down, the apostles' teaching doctrine would be like the Word of God. We've got to get grounded in the Word. We've got to get in the Word every day. And then one arrow is going out, fellowship. We're connecting with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And as iron sharpens iron, one man, person's life sharpens another. And then a, a third uh, uh, arrow pointing inward. When we break bread, when we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, we, we examine ourselves and we're examining our, our relationship with God. But then the prayer arrow going upward they'd get together and they'd ask questions like how can i pray for you this week would you like to have somebody ask you that question who have you asked that question to 
Let me give you two questions here in connection to our personal growth here. You can evaluate this. Do you expect to grow any farther along in your relationship with God than you are right now? Here's the second one. Does your present effort reflect that you really want that to happen? A third commitment they made was to be generous. The first church was a generous church, a church where they were generous with their time, their ability, their money, their encouragement, their love. And I, I picture it this way. I'm standing before God, and I feel like sometimes I'm standing before God like this, like a little kid wanting his next piece of candy. We ought to stand before God like this. We're taking hold of something and say, God, use me in your service. May I be a channel of your love. And fourthly, the commitment to glorify God in all we do. Verse 47, I love the way this passage ends. They were praising God and had favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number to the church daily, those who were being saved. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, you're the light of the world, Christian. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden the same way. Let your light shine before others that they may see your de good deeds and do what? And do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven glorifying the head, Jesus. When, when you talk to somebody, you don't look at their hands, do you? you? You don't stare at their elbows. You look at their face. You focus on the head, and that's what the church is to do. We want people to see the head, the head of the church, Jesus. We want to put Jesus up. A little girl was coming home from church one day, and she said, well, Mom, Mommy, I didn't understand the sermon today. And her mom said, why not? He said, well, you know, the preacher, the preacher said that Jesus is bigger than everything. Was it? Mom said, that's true. The preacher said Jesus lives in us, and Mom said, that's true too. Well, she said, if Jesus is bigger than anything and Jesus lives in us, wouldn't Jesus show through? And I think that's pretty good theology, and that's why Jesus gave us the church to let him show through, because it's not about me, it's not about you, it's all about him, the Savior. It's the church of Jesus Christ, and what does the church mean to him? Here's what it means to him. Ephesians chapter 5, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I'd say it means a lot, wouldn't you? Before I pray, let me read this to you. One congregation put it in their bulletin like this. To all who are weary and seek rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who struggle and desire victory, to all who sin and need a Savior, to all who are idle and look for service, to all who are strangers and want fellowship, to all who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and to whosoever will come, this church opens wide her doors and offers her welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, her Lord. And all the people of Dry Run said what? We say amen. Let's pray.